Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 8, Non-Infectious Disease and Disorders. This is video number 12, and we're going to look at some of the relationships between epidemiology and nutritional disease. So in this little section, we're going to extend what we've already started to look at in terms of epidemiology, um, see if we can analyze some patterns in data, and also just to, to link the patterns we see to uh, incidence and prevalence of diseases, specifically in this case, nutritional disease. So we want to be able to describe any trends that we see. We need to explain those if we can, if we've got some uh, information that we can use to try and explain why trends are the way they are. And then I guess beyond that to analyze in as much detail as we can a range of different data sets that relate to epidemiological studies of nutritional disease. So we started to introduce this idea of epidemiological studies in the previous section of videos. So we want to make sure we're really clear about this stuff. So obviously, if you already are, then you can fast forward through this section. But otherwise, just as a quick review, epidemiology is the study of the incidence of disease in human populations. Now, this can relate to both infectious and non-infectious disease. But it will also relate to the some of the factors that we think might be associated with at least um, factors that contribute to one or more of these different types of disease. What we have to do is collect and analyze large amounts of information. Epidemiological studies are primarily used in the identification of patterns and potential causes of different types of disease. And obviously we're gonna be focusing in this section on non-infectious diseases and specifically on some factors that may affect the incidence of nutritional disease. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to, to identify patterns. So when you get graphic data, uh, when you get pictorial data, sometimes you get um, a global map of distributions of different types of diseases, and you really are trying to pick the patterns out that you can see, to look for those key indicators of where things are more or less likely, and are they related to geographic features, to, uh, I guess, the socioeconomic status of different countries, the types of foods they eat, the quality of the food that they eat, uh, the quantity of the food that they eat, and so on. And epidemiological studies also assist in establishing these causative factors for particular diseases. And the causation is linked to statistical correlation. Now we know, and we've used these two terms before, and we know that they're not interchangeable. Something that correlates two variables together does not necessarily indicate cause and effect, but that is part of why we do our multi-stage epidemiological studies. We do our initial descriptive studies, and then we link our analytical and sometimes our um, interpretive studies to see whether or not um, the factors that we think we've isolated as potential causes are common, and then if we do something to address those factors, does that have any impact on the overall incidence and prevalence of those diseases? So a few of the important studies that have been thrown up as a result of these sorts of epidemiological studies, and I'll just quickly go through this list. We can look at them in a little bit more detail, and they're not all nutritional based, but some of the links that we found, obviously we've talked a little bit about cigarette smoking and heart-lung problems. Uh, you may be aware of the fact that diseases like asbestosis and asbestos mining have, have been linked to diseases like mesothelioma. Um, drugs like thal thalidomide linked to birth defects. Uh, the presence of the rubella virus in pregnant mothers and birth defects in children, and that's led to the um, rubella virus uh, immunization program for um, teenagers usually and dental caries in low fluoride levels. So a link between, um, well, actually what's happened is that fluoride has been added to our drinking water and we have seen an uh, improvement in the teeth quality um, over time. There's other factors obviously associated to that in terms of our awareness of um, regular brushing, uh, flossing, all of those sorts of things. But definitely the addition of fluorine to drinking water has had an impact on reducing um, the incidence of things like dental caries. So some of the key features of epidemiological studies, well, they are need, if they're going to be reliable, uh, longitudinal data. 
Okay, so we need them over a reasonable period of time. One of the things with disease is that it can take a little while for symptoms to appear and it can take a little while for those symptoms to disappear. Of course, that depends on the type of disease. Sometimes they never disappear. But if we're trying to, to link cause and effect and then we're trying to look at what happens if we intervene, then um, we have to have some sort of uh, longitudinal data in order to do that. We also, if we're going to make sure that there's validity, we need very large sample sizes. We can't afford to have tiny samples and think, well, this works for a couple of people in my local area, so obviously it's going to work for everyone across the world, um, not mentioning anything specific uh, right there. The demographic data that's collected should include both affected and unaffected people, and in all other cases, there should be similarities. And these are, case, uh, these are studies that we regard as case controlled. So what we've tried to do is find two groups of people that are very, very similar in a range of different demographic data, with the exception of the particular type of things that we're looking for. When we're doing these studies, we need to make sure that if they're going to again have some sort of validity, we need to have a broad range of society and lifestyle. So this isn't a finding that's peculiar to a particular group, maybe a particular group of people that have a similar occupation, live in a certain area, are all males, are all over 50, etc. cetera. Uh, cohort studies will link to control groups, and these ones are where we've found two groups, one of which is similar to the test group but has not been exposed to what we believe might be the cause of the disease. So these cohort studies, very similar to the case controlled studies, um, but in a sense we're trying to use our understanding of controls, of comparison groups to say, well, these people should all have developed the, in roughly the same way because we can see some similarities to our test group, but they haven't been exposed to what we think is um, uh, a contributor to a particular type of disease. These terms I'm going to keep using now, assuming that you're comfortable with them, and it's very important, um, like all biology, to make sure that the terminology um, is, is terminology that you can use with comfort when you're writing, so that you understand the difference between incidence and prevalence, you understand the difference between mortality and morbidity. So new cases versus total cases, and um, the, the number of cases overall versus the number of um, deaths linked specifically to that disease. Our studies should have statistical analyses. We don't always need to necessarily understand all of those statistical tests at this level, but certainly if you um, progress in your biology studies, you will, will get to look at some statistical testing and actually look at areas uh, where we're, we're trying to establish significance. Is there a significance um, statistically in the patterns and the trends that we see. For us, we're just going to have a look at the data and, and basically with the eyeball test, see if, whether or not we think that we can identify some, some patterns or trends. Uh, that may help us to identify possible causes of diseases or at least some risk factors that might be associated with increased incidence of certain diseases and develop management plans, strategies, public health, and of course, those very important intervention um, studies where we see whether or not the, the processes we've put into place have actually had any significant impact. So what are we asking you to do? Well, we're asking you to, uh, to, to, to collect some data or to analyze some data. So this will either be data that you'll be given in class or you might be given in an HSC question and it might be graphical, it might be um, uh, trends, tables, uh, all sorts of different things, maps, as I said, of distributions. We want you to see if you can describe the trend. So the first level is always the describe level. What do you see? Are things going up? Are they going down? Is there a difference between uh, males and females? Is there a difference between young people and old people? Are there difference in different other, other differences based on differences in demographics? Or are there some specific uh, things that relate to diet, um, that relate to amount of exercise, amount of water, all of those sorts of things. We want you to see if you can explain why a particular disease affects human populations in the way that the data is showing. And then beyond that, to also see if you can uh, propose ideas about the sorts of factors that may affect incidence and prevalence of particular diseases in certain regions or countries. When you are looking at nutrition, you're going to get data probably on things like obesity, 
which is going to relate very uh, significantly to diet. You might also find data on diabetes, um, iron deficiency and uh, anemia, um, calcium deficiency or low calcium levels, um, and, and so on. There's a range. Iodine's another important one. We've talked about uh, scurvy, vitamin C deficiency. So there's quite a number of different types of, or, or certainly different types of important nutrients that we have in the body, but also different diseases that can relate to um, uh, either an excess or uh, a too little of particular types of chemicals, and therefore they have uh, an impact and, uh, and a significant uh, causation on certain types of disease. So that's the next thing to do is to grab some of these uh, different graphs, start to analyze some of the patterns that you can see. And we'll have a look at one of those in specific detail in the next video. Thanks very much for watching.